Okay, uh, welcome MCT students and sound art students to this special lecture from Ole Neerling. Ole Neerling is an interdisciplinary lifestyle artist from the Netherlands. He is expert in music, visual art performance, new media and craftsmanship. Instead of accepting it's just the way it is, one could also wonder why things are the way they are and act upon their findings. In November 2017, Ole started an apprenticeship in recorder building at the world-renowned workshop of Adriana Brukink. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, allowing insight into traditional instrument building alongside an artistic practice. And now a small introduction to today's lecture. Children learn through playful interactions with their surroundings. Most child's play is based on sandbox situations, actual sandboxes, construction toys, drawing, and social role play. These forms of exploration are essential in the development of human traits. A field where this exploration is limited is sound. Tools and toys manufactured for creative sonic exploration cater to conventional forms of music. Furthermore, these tools require pre-existing knowledge and technique in order to be operated properly. This talk focuses on challenging these notions and poses the question how sonic exploration can be expanded upon to benefit the development of future generations. There will be a break for 10 minutes at around 12 o'clock, possibly a bit later now. Uh, if all questions can be saved for later, there will be time allocated for this. So without further ado, I would like you all to give a warm welcome to Ole. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So, yeah, as you see, he said interdisciplinary, and it says extradisciplinary. And this is a very recent change, but I'll cover this for you. Uh, so my name is Ole Neeling. I'm a Dutch extradisciplinary lifestyle artist. Um, and um, I want to give you a quick, too long, didn't read from this lecture. Today we'll talk about music and language, uh, traits that make you human, how to become trendy, and how to brainwash children. So I want to start out with giving you a, a, a bit of an overview of what I do uh, prior to getting deeper into the subject matter, because I think it might be a, a valuable um, perspective to give to have a better idea of how I approach things. Um, so in 2016, I was a, um, a student at KIT in NTNU, and I decided not to rent a room in Trondheim to live, and I built a cabin in Bimarka. Um, and the students at KIT called it Skawit, so I adopted the name and it became a cabin in Bimarka up till 2017 when we went back there with the team uh, to make a movie about it and uh, deconstruct the cabin and ship it to the Netherlands for exhibitions. So now it's been traveling through Europe, Belgium, and uh, soon hopefully we'll go to Germany as well uh, to um, show not only the cabin as it in a literal one-on-one -on -one representation as the cabin that stood in Norway, but also, um, and we'll get later back to that, try to experiment with how you can apply an artwork in a secondary level. Like how can you take someone that you're, something you already made and apply it in a new fashion? Um, when we went to Trondheim to make the movie uh, about this, um, we had no experience in movie making. So I brought a guy with me who had some experience in camera usage, but through his course, but he was mostly on web design. And um, uh, we kind of stole two cameras from the academy, which we were not allowed to take outside of the building, a very nice drone. And we went into Bimarka to, uh, to record a film. I will show a very short clip of this, if the computer wants to work with me. So some people will recognize some parts of Trondheim here, but I want to go to uh, a bit in the end where you see the location of the cabin uh, in Bimaka. Thank you. 
So it's quite difficult to give some people, most people, the idea of what the cabin in the forest, how it feels. It's, you have to take them there to show the location. And we try to, in a way, show the relationship between how close Trondheim is to this vast, I mean, it's as big as Trondheim itself, Bimarka, to this really big um, uh, natural environment. And... Um, uh, we finished the movie and we showed it alongside the cabin to give people an idea of what it was like. But in the end, it'd be best if you go to the forest yourself. But we'll get back to that later because we try to find a way to get people really into the experience. Um, another project that I did was Esoterrorism, which is a backpack FM private sta station, like a radio station. Um, you carry a uh, modular Eurorack synthesizer on your belly. You have a backpack with an FM synthesizer uh, uh, sender on it uh, on your back. It has two battery packs so you can power both the Eurorack and the FM sender. And it allows you to be mobile while pirating on the FM. The problem here in Norway is that the FM has been kind of abandoned by the government, which uh, is something that hasn't happened yet in the Netherlands, but they're continuously talking about. And I wanted to kind of have some questions about what will happen when the government will, or the official channels will leave, uh, will we have something like an analog internet at our disposal where everyone can send and everyone can receive if they have a receiver or a sender? Um, I don't, I'm really curious to see how, how it went here in Norway because I haven't got a very clear picture yet because now you went to digital FM. Um, but I heard that there are some very local stations still around. I drove around... I came here by car and, and I tried to tune into some stations. I got some fake stuff, but uh, it, to me, it's not very clear yet. But in the Netherlands, this is still like the FM is really relevant. And we have this large culture of pirate stations. Our classical, official classical station started out as a boat in international waters sending out illegal FM signals um, because there was no classical music on the radio. And then later they were permitted to have their own uh, frequency. I also do more minimalist sculptural work. So this is Pulsa. The cabin in the forest was built with wood that I found in containers in Trondheim. And before being able to cut them into planks, uh, the wooden beams, I made an installation where I arranged them in a certain way throughout a office space, turned the office space completely black and put a rotating light in the middle. And then you have all these shadows and shapes drawing on the wall. But to make it even more of an alien space, we got this, um, how do you call it, uh, the fog machine uh, substance, put it on a hot plate. So you have this very humid, very almost like a jungle climate area. I also built this, uh, um, well, it's a starter pack, like a chemistry box for children to make a fire. Um, the all-in-one starter pack for my first fire. In it, you get the wooden logs, the smaller wooden sticks, the tinder, and underneath the user manual, there's also matches. And it helps you step by step to make a fire. Um, this question's a bit of like, uh, you have, in the Netherlands especially, most people live in cities and they don't go out to cut wood and make a fire as a child. Uh, you have to be part of the scouting to have this experience mostly, or have parents with a farm. But I, I know that in Norway, it's a bit more common that you grow up making fires and going into the mountains and stuff like that. But because we don't have that much nature, uh, people don't grow up with this experience. And there's commonly more fear for fire than understanding, which results in people wanting to reject fire as a, um, well, as a part of our development as human beings. And uh, they want to slowly, bit by bit, restrict people making fires. I don't think it will change people so much, but it's uh, hopefully a way to get into a discussion. I also do more traditional music, which I will show you a bit about. Mm -hmm. 
bit of a pity that there's so much lag but I didn't expect that the, the video runs smoothly usually but okay um, so no, I, I started out as a musician and when I was younger I was a, a boy soprano from when I was 11 to 15 and um, so the choice was made very early to go into music and then around 2011 I decided not to go into music anymore so and then I went into fine arts and later you rediscover your passions and it becomes a fundamental part of how you work. Uh, but today we were talking about um, Olme, um, a modular, well, semi-modular synthesizer setup for uh, toddlers. And uh, this is, you know, the rediscovery of music and the integration of it in visual arts. Very often you will get people saying that there's a distinct difference between the two visual arts and music, and I think most people here would consider themselves musicians or sound artists rather than visual artists. Um, and the same happened to me when I was in uh, art school. The teachers told me that there's so much difference between music and fine art that the two, that there's almost no relationship. Um, having a lot of mu sound artists in the world, I think they all disagree. Um, but this is for me, this was for me a reason to leave the sculpture department and go to media where people were a bit more liberal about these distinctions. And uh, in 2015, the idea for Olme started to come along, but it, it's been a really long journey to get from an idea to this part, you know, to have an actual prototype working. Um, I want to dive into really quickly um, the definition extradisciplinary. As in the beginning said, interdisciplinary, extradisciplinary, there's a lot of ways of how you can treat the things that you are uh, specialized in. So if you have a special team, you stay within it, interdisciplinary, then you would have uh, a, a very inward focus, specialized, a high, high degree of expertise, but it also comes with a risk. Maybe 2008 has learned us that if you're specialized in one field, it's very, very easy to get kicked out and it becomes really difficult to integrate somewhere else. Of course, it depends on your perspective. If you're able to find relationships between what you're good in and other fields that might match, and you're a bit more flexible, then you can reintegrate in maybe the work field easier. But uh, personally, I find, and this is not a specific choice, this is how I rolled into it um, by well, what feels good to me. Um, is I, I have certain things that I know a lot about. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a master musician or I'm a master visual artist, but I know stuff about this, and these are my disciplines. But I'm also really, really curious about gardening or about fishing. I sometimes I go to Norway to fish in the sea, and um, but I don't. I'm not. I'm not disciplined in these things as much. So for me to take what I'm good at and then add something that I'm not good in, and I try to find matching platforms in this uh, allows me not only to develop my already existing. Um, disciplines and to learn the new ones but also to find the new audience the people who are let's take fishing for example uh, are really good at fishing usually don't go to museum to look at fine arts but if you can find a way to match these two audiences the people who are into fine arts might find something in fishing that they didn't know about that they really like and vice versa um, and it also allows you to collaborate which is not something that happens so much in visual arts 
more in music. And I find it a pity because I think visual artists could benefit greatly from this. So the basis for, well, this philosophy of how you work can be found in Joseph Boyce. And uh, I think this is the fam most famous quote that he's known for. Uh, Joseph Beuys is a, uh, an artist uh, from Germany, and he, we see him here covered in honey, gold leaf, and he's talking to a dead rabbit about paintings. Um, this is one of his performances, and his, his quote, Jeder Mensch ist ein Künstler, is, um, I think it's very often misunderstood as his quest to turn everyone into an artist, but I think what he tries to tell us is in every discipline and every passion that someone has you will find that there's a part of it that can be considered as valuable so valuable that you can turn it into art and it's your perspective of this that limits you from being someone who's good at fishing than being someone who is an artist using fishing as a subject so for me one of the first things that i did when i graduated was i became a, a apprentice at adriana brucking and we collaborated, uh, well, she taught me at first to make recorders, and then later I tried to take those things that I learned from her and put it into more visual art. Um, so this is a more, I would almost say, like traditional sculptural artworks um, based upon the knowledge that I got material-wise, but she taught me a lot about um, music itself as well. In recorder building, you turn wood at a very high speed and you try to get it as close as a hundredth of a millimeter precise which is with wood, it's breathing, it's moving, it's really difficult. So you have some leeway, but to make everything fit, and especially to make the tone right and to make it sound good, you have to be very precise. And this is something that I never learned on art school, and I never learned on the conservatorium, on the music school. So it was a, a new field for me. I could bring my knowledge of music and fine art along, um, and we got really interesting discussions about the development. For example, the moment that I got in, we were talking about, well, how can we make um, the valves that you have on recorders? Because we're not talking about, we're talking about school recorders as well. We're also talking about recorders that are almost as high as the ceiling here. And then to be able to play it, you need valves. You need a way to have the keys move the valves and a long distance. And they were playing around with 3D printing, but the material's not there yet. And um, uh, so there's a part of aesthetics as well, 3D printing, you have a certain feeling, you have a certain look and a certain vibe. And in the end, we decided to go back to messing, back to metal. And um, uh, I think in the end, like these discussions with her about how she sees her work, how she wants to develop new prototypes, new instruments, it gave me a lot of insight in my personal work as well. And then the part of lifestyle art. So you will have um, a knowledge. Every one of you knows uh, a lifestyle artist, even though we will not define them as such, because most of us will know Andy Warhol or Salvador Dali. Um, the thing about lifestyle artists is you will know them for mostly who they were, but, and you will know some of their work. But most of us will know Andy Warhol for Andy Warhol and not for his oeuvre. Uh, the same with Salvador Lali. We know some of his paintings, but the older he got, the more he was focused upon his personality. So at the end of his life, and same with Andy Warhol, you have an artist whose art has become the artist himself. Andy Warhol specifically, because he was someone who wore a lot of wigs, he had a large collection of clothing. Um, I think the factory is a perfect example of someone who tries to delve deeper and into collaboration, but move the production away from himself. So let other people have the connections, let other people, um, well, give him ideas, and then we'll make art of, out of it. Um, another thing, and I think this is the most interesting development in art, well, maybe ever, is Wagner. So Wagner uh, thinks about the Gesamtkunstwerk. And the Gesamtkunstwerk, you will find it in his uh, theater in Germany. Um, you have this um, Ring der Nibelungen opera trilogy. 
It's a bit like the Lord of the Rings. And he developed a theater specifically to show this uh, opera. So everything around the opera, not just the costumes and the, the, the stage and the way how the people sing and the way how the people move, but also the building around it and the, um, the event around it. You can still go and see these operas in the specific house. Uh, has to be catered to give a total experience of the artwork. So uh, Wagner was a quite influential guy and um, there was a king called Ludwig II in Germany who liked his work so much, he was such a big fan of the Ring der Nibelunge, that he commissioned the construction of a castle uh, specifically in the style of Wagner's fantasy. So this is uh, the Neuschwanstein castle. It was finished in 1886. Um, I think the Ludwig II lived here for about two months before he died. It took them, I think, like 40, 45 years to build. Uh, and it wasn't completely finished when he moved in. Uh, from what I've heard, there's also a swan lake inside where you can paddle around in a boat. <laughs> um, this, this is one of the most crazy ideas you can get your head around. Because this guy reads, he doesn't read a book, he goes to an opera. He finds the story being told so fascinating that he thinks this has to be reality. I have to turn the world around. This fantasy that someone has, this story that someone told me, I'm going to build you know, my entire kingdom around it. So and that's what he did. Um, it's still around. You can still visit it. It's, it's based on this fantasy idea that we have of the medieval times. Uh, very re renaissance. Very crazy. And the thing that these people have in common is uh, something you will find in the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. The tipping point revolves around how trends work. So how... Maybe we all know hush puppies, the shoes, or um, like fidget spinners. This is something that happens very sudden. It has a spike with the popularity. Some people make a, a ton of money, and then it disappears again. And with, with shoes or with clothing, sometimes it goes a bit slower. With fidget spinners, it goes really fast. And, um, but it's not something that just happens because the audience thinks, oh, that's nice, I'll, I'll buy this and then I'll use it. There's very specific people and a very small amount, percentage of the population that has a large influence in how we see things. So there's three, three categories in this. There's the salesman, the maven, and the connector. Each one of them has a expertise, and, and it's a very social one, um, which allows them to do something very specific. The salesman is capable of selling you anything that he wants to sell you because they come across very convincing. They can look you in the eye and you feel that they are, by, by buying this, they enrich your experience of life. The maven does this, but with ideas. So the salesman is more of an object-orientated. Maven is more idea-orientated. So they can tell you about something and you find it so profoundly inspiring that you will change your life around it. And the connector is someone, well, I mean, technically seen, every one of us has a, one of these people in their lives, maybe one or two. The connector is someone who knows everyone. Like maybe you have a friend who knows everyone. They go out in the street and they, every five minutes, they say hi to someone. Maybe in Trondheim, because it's a small city, we have more connections and we know more people. But uh, in larger cities, very often you will find there's one or two people uh, per district that have all the connections and they allow connections for others to exist. Um, maybe a, a quick story about the, uh, the connector, for example. Uh, we all know that when the English invaded the USA, there's this moment where the people start ditching tea in the sea. And um, the, well, I mean, they, they already invaded it, but the Americans wanted to be, have the more, um, they wanted to be free. So they started ditching tea in the sea. And the English army said, okay, well, enough with this. We're going into the mainland and push down the rebellion. And so a lot of boats arrived with the English army in Boston, and they started to disembark. The moment that people saw this, there's two people in history written down that went out into the countryside to tell people that the English army was coming. Uh, they did this during the night on a horse. And one guy went by several villages, and the moment the English army arrived the next day, Nobody was there uh, to fight them, so every village was taken over. The other guy managed to convince 
uh, several other people to go and ride out. And the moment the English army arrived, there was army standing there and they were defeated. So, but the problem was the first guy didn't manage to do it. So we have the civil war or the, um, well, the independence war, I'm sorry. Um, meaning that by being able to convince other people to do something and to have a good way of connecting with other people and communicating with them, you can change history. Now, this way of working is um, something that you experience through trial and error. So, as I told before, I have this cabin in the forest here in Norway. We deconstruct it and we bring it to the Netherlands. We have a little video next to it to show what it was like in the area. But what you really want to give people is the experience of being in the forest themselves. And um, you have maybe a couple of thousand people visiting an exhibition uh, in a museum. And you can't give every single one of those people that experience. So what you might want to do is try and find other artists to collaborate with um, and experiment with what will happen if they have this experience and they make work about it from a different angle so people have a different perspective. So I asked nine other artists. We put the cabin in the forest in the Netherlands and asked nine different artists to stay here for a week and make work about it. And um, in this way, um, I had to combine art, which I'm okay at. I collab uh, collaborations, which I have also experienced, but I have no experience in organization, which is, you know, this extracurricular trait. You have to find something you're not good at and combine it. So um, I had to learn a lot about how to do PR, how to communicate with artists, which is quite difficult at times because artists... Well, they have their own way of doing things. Um, you are responsible for everything. The, f the food, in a way. How do you communicate to the artist that, yes, you will have to go and try find food in the dumpster. And if not, then you should bring your own food. You know? I can give you some, some logs to make a fire, but you have to go out and get logs. If you want to go to the toilet, <laughs> you will have to go into the woods and you have to dig a hole. So these are things that you have to, to, to experiment with. How do you communicate with people? about these things. Um, and uh, there's also this problem. The moment that you do a project like this, it costs money. I mean, everything costs money. But you want to have a specific result because you want to show the people that are funding this project, like, okay, this is how we're going to approach it. Um, there's a stickiness problem. How do, you, how do you think of something that will stick with the people that go and visit it, but also the people that hear about it? So the example for exa um, that didn't work was Coca-Cola sponsoring Barcelona in 92, uh, the Olympics. Uh, Coca-Cola paid 33 million US dollars to be the official sponsor. Um, but there was so much push for advertising during these Olymp Olympics that um, only 15% of the people interviewed in a, a test afterwards uh, remembered that Coca-Cola was the official sponsor. And 5% thought it was Pepsi. And the rest of the people didn't even know there was such a thing as an official sponsor. So the amount of advertising completely broke the concept of an official sponsor. The um, uh, problem with it as well is that if you have four advertisements of 15 seconds long in a period of two and a half minutes, um, the effect of the, you know, it doesn't stick. The, the effect of the advertisement is almost completely gone. Um, so the concept for this project, what are we going to try to sell to people? We're going to try to sell the experience of loneliness with a lack of luxury. So um, we try to find a way for people to relate to the experience. And there's two very primary ways of how you can feel alone. You can be a protagonist in a novel by Sartre and feel alone in the crowd in Paris. You know, you're alone in the masses, which is um, becoming a more and more accepted form of loneliness now that everyone's you know on social media but we don't really have that in intense social connection like we used to have or you can start calling volleyballs wilson or die in a bus in canada which means you know you're robinson crusoe you're stuck in the island you become a pinnacle of you know admiration people say oh, i want to go to the place where the guy died um or but at the same time you completely reject society so um 
this is where we get to the point where we start to wonder, well, what makes us human? When are we, as a human, alone in a crowd or alone in the forest? And I had this experience when I was in Norway in the cabin. When I was alone for longer periods of time, um, I found that I started to talk to myself. I do this very often, actually, but um, I don't need to be in the forest for this. Um, maybe I'm already crazy. But at the same time, um, I was really curious why I started to talk to myself more and more and more. You have this um, theory that the moment that people start talking to themselves in nature, that it is start them trying to retain a certain degree of humanity because we are human in a way because we interact with other humans because then we know what it's like to be another human. So I started to wonder if you start talking to yourself, what does it mean? Well, there's these areas in the brain that are related to speech, but they are all really also related to tool usage. And uh, this research is specifically done um, on, and I'm trying to pronounce it without failing, Ocleanian napping, which is taking um, the um, um, flint and napping it into specific tools for tool usage. From uh, what we are aware, the only species that does this preparing of tools to fit a specific need is the human. So um, what they find in these researches is that um, the area, there are specific areas that match both tool usage, tool preparance, and the concept that you're going to use a tool with language usage. So this is, this is already a basis for, well, how are we going to play with the development of tools and language development. Music as a language and instruments as a tool. So we're already moving towards a basis for Olma. You'll see that the area for language, when it's activated, it comes very close to the area that's being activated when napping flint. It's not identical because talking with your mouth and generating words is not identical to moving your hands and making a tool, but they're close enough. And um, maybe the interesting part of this is that we are aware that the, these areas of the brain develop most when we are a child, like a child develops their language at a very young age. Um, and there's always among psychologists uh, the desire to study the untouched human, to see what happens when you don't give them culture, if you don't give them language. Of course, it's not very ethical to lock someone up in a room and see what happens, but at the same time, uh, it might be interesting to look at the people who, well, unfortunately experience this. Uh, so there's a very famous example of Victor of Avignon, uh, which is a Victorian time story. Uh, he was a boy in south of France who was abandoned by his drunk parents, and he was living in a forest together with wild animals mostly dogs and wolves. And uh, he was discovered uh, when he was 12 or 13. He came out of the forest and people took him in. And there was a doctor in Paris who was very interested in working with the boy. They wanted to see if he can make made civil again. You know, you know, maybe you remember the time when they went to America with boats and they took uh, Native Americans with them and try to dress them up and give them cutlery and say, oh, wow, they're almost human. But um, and this guy said, well, maybe we can take this boy, teach him language, teach him how to use cutlery, teach him the proper you know, manners of uh, the Renaissance. And they failed horribly. It was impossible to teach him how to speak because it just didn't stick. He didn't understand the notion of communication in such a fashion either. And um, cutlery, uh, well, was thrown around the room mostly. They managed to keep clothes on him, but after five years of trying to work with the boy, they put him in a mental hospital for deaf people. And uh, because they figured if you can't talk, then maybe it's because you can't hear. There's a more reason uh, case of Jeannie Wiley. Uh, Jeannie was, um, it was thought by her father that she was mentally ill when he was, he was very young. And it's not, well, they don't know if it's true or not because he locked her up till she was 12 years old. Um, 
in a room. She was tied to a toilet most of the day and at night tied to a bed. And then um, when uh, the, they discovered she was, this, this was the case, they rescued her. Um, the moment that this happened, the entire um, society of psychologists jumped on this case and tried to find you know, answers to questions that they had after reading about the previous case, for example, because this doesn't happen so much. Uh, but her mother stopped it, and ever since 1978, it's no longer allowed to, um, to have contact with her. From what we know, she's still alive, and she managed to learn very crude English. So no grammar at all, but she can reply with single word answers. Um, so she developed a certain abstract notion of reality and managed to prescribe meaning to objects and communicate this with people. Um, and they will manage to give her a quality of life happily. So Noam Chomsky um, uh, is a very interesting guy because he almost single-handedly developed the field of linguistics in his spare time. And he came up with the notion of universal grammar. And um, universal grammar, according to Chomsky, is the underlying foundation that we have in language when we look at a child being adopted from, let's say, China, moved to America. They can learn perfect American English. They can speak without an accent. Um, they can, it becomes their mother native tongue. Um, and when you're young enough, being placed back into the other environment, you can learn the other language as well in a natural fashion. Uh, when you get older, this is like commonly accepted, it becomes more difficult to learn the language. But at the same time, um, there's exper experiments done with artificial languages, for example, Klingon. There's a guy who was really into Klingon, uh, he was a linguist, and he tried to teach his son from a very young age to speak Klingon fluently. And he managed to do this. Um, but when the boy reached a social age where he started to interact with other children on a more frequent basis, he found out that no one else spoke Klingon and he started to reject the language. When he was 15, they did another test to see if he, um, if he could remember anything about the language. Um, and the boy didn't recognize, he didn't even remember he was able to speak this language at all. Seeing himself on videotape talking this language, he was really freaked out about it and very angry with his father. But there are examples that are less extreme uh, of people um, trying to do this experiment uh, and also on the basis of music. The shags um, is an example of this. Um, so the father of these Wigan girls, um, he wanted to have the pure band, the band that was playing pure music. They were not allowed to listen to any music, but they had to form a band and play uh, pop music. Um, I'll let you hear a bit later, like, uh, but it's, it's an interesting result. He thought that band would be better than the Beatles because the Beatles were influenced by popular culture. They were developed by people and this was pure and real. Um, after a while, I think they, when the father died, they completely disbanded the band right away. Um, I can't imagine what life must have been like in this, this household where you're, you're forced to uh, express yourself creatively, but without being able to you know, research or experiment in already existing culture. Um, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I wonder if uh, if the father succeeded at his, uh, his, his desire to make the most pure band, but uh, uh, it's a common thing that people are interested in these, what happens when you, um, what, what happens with what you feed people culturally 
as an, an, an information wise, what happens with the development of the brain. Um, and then the question comes, uh, especially within singing, music, uh, which was there first, the singing or the speaking? You know, the, there's a research done by a Dutch um, uh, artist. They made the porn opera, which is an opera focused solely and completely on moaning uh, erotically. Um, and uh, it replaces all the singing. Uh, they'd say that this is the what happened before people started to put words to sounds and to um, melodic structures. They were just grunting, trying to communicate a feeling. Because there's a big difference between talking and the, the, the verbal language and musical language. I'll let you hear it. So it's an hour long opera working towards the climax. Um, what I, I'm, I'm personally not the biggest fan of this, but what I find interesting in this is that um, there is a notion as within the singer that they are aware that they are trying to convey, convey a certain meaning, but they, even when you use like just melody, it's uh, for the people listening to it, they understand that there's, something that you're trying to tell them, a certain content, a certain contest, the text. Um, but without using words, it becomes interpretation. It's uh, your perspective implied, implied upon the music. And um, here we are very well aware that there's this like a, well, it's a duet of two people working towards a certain point. But in tr more traditional music, uh, it becomes more difficult. Um, and... I find that this is also a basis of the origin of Ullman. You see, when you have language, um, language in general is structured about um, uh, this desire to convey a certain content. Um, tr you try to give someone a certain, um, in certain degree of information. You use it to classify the camera, the door, the roof. But in music, it becomes more complex. You can translate German to English, but you can not really translate German to the guitar. And not in the same way that if you take a piece by a, a writer, that someone completely and fully understands exactly what the writer wrote by playing it on the guitar. But you can get a feeling of what he meant by the way how you play it. So there's some emotional aspects there that you are able to, to convey. Now, when we think about instruments for children, um, we often come across, especially when we go to the, the toy store, we come across this. And I wonder if this is an instrument to begin with. It's a sampler that plays one riff when you push one button, another riff when you play another bu push another button in the shape of an instrument. Um, it allows you to, well, uh, it's almost like a, you give it the child a guitar, the child stands with the guitar and everyone's, oh, it's just like a rock star. And, um, uh, but, and the child will have a direct response from its parents by pushing the button. Everyone's like, oh, it's so fun. After a few moments, the fun is gone at the, and the adults and the child will have the joy of pushing a button and having a direct response. And the parents most often will be disappointed in them. Um, but what you want to have is an ability to play with sound the same way you can play with clay, the same way you can play with crayons. This is like giving a child a plastic crayon. Like here, you can play with the crayon, draw, but it leaves no marks. Whereas 
ideally you would want to give a child the ability to explore with crayons it's 2d with blocks you can give it a 3d experience with clay you can give it a very tactile experience and of course the child will go as far as they can they will draw off the of the paper onto the floor onto the wall and the same with sound the child enjoys the fact that they push a button and that there is a response it's a social experiment as well because they do this with parents all the time as well. They try to push your buttons and see how far they can go to get a response out of you. Um, but the question is, is this really a musical instrument? I'd say no. The same with giving a child a ukulele, for example. It might be the size of a child, but it lacks the technique to grab chords or pluck uh, strings in a certain sequence to make what we would consider music. Um, and it also lacks the theory behind it. So uh, even though there is, I have no problem with ukuleles or toy pianos, I don't think that they're the right instruments for children to really explore sound in the same way that you would explore clay or crayons or blocks. And companies know that kids are big bucks. So Coca-Cola has done a, uh, several studies and they have an entire symposium actually about how to get kids to think about coca-cola the moment that they get thirsty so when you're one or two years old they want you to already think i'm thirsty i want coca-cola even without being able to understand the concept of what coca-cola is it has to be in your subconscious so they also understand the same as what we talked before this moment in time when you're very young you're still learning a language you're still learning how to use tools because that's what playing with clay and playing with crayons is um, uh, you are very easily influenced by your surroundings. And if someone tells you, don't jump off the cliff, you have to accept that not jumping off the cliff is good for you. Of course, when you're 15, you want to get really close to the cliff and see what's down there. But up to a certain age, you have to accept that your parents, they understand the world better than you do, so you have to accept their word for truth. But in a world where people give their children a tablet and they go on YouTube and they watch video after video after video and all the advertisements in between, people, um, the people running these companies know that this is the moment that you can really like, tickle them and make sure that when they want to think, oh, I'm thirsty, that they think about Coca-Cola. So this is the basis of, from the extra, um, the extra uh, disciplinary perspective for the start of the design of Olme. I think it's 12 right now. It's 3 past 12. We have 10 minutes break, and then we continue into how the instruments became phys physical. Yeah. Is this good for you? Hey, hello. Hello. I can see myself in the screen, through the screen. It's quite strange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 10 minutes break and see you back here. In okay, welcome back. Um, Ole, uh, take, it from, take it from the top. From the top? Or from the All middle. the way from, from the, the middle. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, uh, let's do a quick summary for what we talked about. Um, so up to now, we've been discussing approaches, work methods. How do you approach a project from uh, where you're going to do something that you have no experience in with? Um, how are you um, uh, trying to get it into the public's interest and the public's eye so that they think, okay, well, this is interesting enough for me to relate to and, and invest my time and my energy in because that's, pretty much what you request people to do when you ask them to look at your work. And um, uh, secondly, we've been looking into the background, and mostly uh, a degree of linguistics and a human development, brain development. What can we, um, which is a, a something that I have very little experience in. I'm not a neurologist, but by reading a couple of papers, you get a bit of a perspective on how people function. And it might be interesting to then try and do something with that. So. Um, I had the idea of making um, instruments uh, prior to becoming an apprentice at the recorder studio, but also um, prior to making Oma, because I have a background in music. Um, I was getting really interested in how uh, electronic music works. I have a, a, a classical background, and maybe 
like I, now I can't imagine, but I didn't understand how they made club music. How is it made? What kind of instruments do they use? This was when I was, was 20 and you would expect people 20 years old to understand what synthesizers are. I had no clue. So for me to discover the concept of a sequencer was like, oh, wow, I want to have a sequencer really, really badly. Um, but I found that they were quite expensive. Like, okay, you can get a, a cheap one for around 100 euros or maybe a second-hand one from the 80s for almost nothing at the second-hand store. But then uh, you would have to have MIDI or you would have to have CV. And I didn't have a synthesizer. So I decided I should build my own uh, sequencer. This is where the first idea of building an instrument came from, an electronic instrument came from. Um, uh, it turns out it's way more expensive to build your own sequencer, <laughs> but okay. Um, so the, the, from an extra uh, disciplinary perspective, we use music and art as our disciplines, and then we use product design as, an, as something that I have no experience with at all. Um, I know how to make an artwork, but I don't know how to sell it. And I know how to make music, but nobody's buying it. So um, how can I make something that people might be interested in enough that they want to engage with it, put their time and maybe in the future their money into it? Uh, well, there's this uh, fundament that arised from the research that we just talked about prior to the break, which is that if you want to have music and be able to play with it in a clay fashion, you would have to design a product that allows you to do this without um, requesting the child to have a musical technical knowledge uh, or musical theory knowledge. Um, and the goal is that everyone, every household should have a synthesizer, ideally a modular synthesizer. Uh, but these things are really expensive. And if you look at modular, um, some of you might have some Eurorack or even Buchla, um, you would find that uh, it is not really designed for a child to control. Maybe the music easel, it's very colorful and it looks nice, but um, to be able to understand what's happening as a child, you would have to really go back to the basics. Uh, at first, as I thought about, well, if I want to have this communication with people, um, I would have to look into music notation. I would have to understand how music notation conveys the concept of music the same way that written language conveys the concept of language. So I was really inspired by this album cover by Mike Oldfield. Um, the graphic score of his track Taurus 2, uh, it, it gave me this punk feel, even though if you know his music, it's not really very punk. Um, it's, it's more of a dreamy Scottish, Irish um, vibe. But um, uh, when I saw this, I thought, well, maybe from, it's, it's possible for me to, to make something like this as well, to think of some way of communicating with people, to uh, play music that, um, that you don't know, have to know any music theory or any music uh, technique for. And um, of course, here you could say that the Lin machine and the drum mix, these are two instruments and there's no definition here what they should play. So it was just a guy at a Lin machine, a Lin drum, and uh, someone doing the drum mix, and you can, they can do whatever, as long as they do it in this undefined time. Like this could take five seconds, this would take two hours, it, you don't really know. Um, and we have a very rich history of music notation, so it, it's not difficult to find better examples of this. We can go all the way back to the first uh, music notation that we know of, this is uh, the hymn to Nikal. Uh, so in Syria, they found these 30 tablets where there are fractions of songs written down. They managed to decode it because they knew um, the language, the, 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 the writing, the type of writing. Um, and uh, there's only one tablet that's complete. And this is the one tablet. And there's people who try to um, interpret it. So what you see, and uh, there's two lines, and above the two lines, there's the lyrics, and uh, below the two lines, there's the music notation. No one knows how to pronounce the lyrics because no one knows what the language sounded like. Um, 
but it's interesting to see that they already have this like tablature kind of vibe where you have the, lang the, the text and the, the notation combined on one, uh, on one page. Um, well, you're all music students, so you must be aware of John Cage's ex exploration into the experiment to music. And he did a song called Water Walk. Um, and this is his way of writing down the song, how to play Water Walk. So at 10 seconds, above you see all the, the second notations, he starts tape, and at 15 seconds, he does a pizzicato on the piano, and then there's an explosion. And there's some steam and a fish in the bathtub. But what this really means, like he knows what he wants to do, but everyone else playing the song will have a different um, approach. The steam, for, will it go very slowly? Will it go very fast? Will he leave it out for two or three seconds? It's all... Maybe it's in his feeling, maybe it's in something he really, really wants to precisely uh, tack down. Uh, there's a recording of this as well. And I've got a secret, 90s. I see that the, the video is faster than the sound. So it, it kind of defeats the point to keep it running. But um, these are actions. You could say that playing on the guitar is a certain set of actions that you, uh, you do in a certain progression. Um, and this is just very, uh, maybe it's one instrument that he uses. Maybe it's a collection of different instruments. But he's generating sound through action. And he tries to record those actions. Um, yeah, this is <laughs> um, Ianis Chinakis. I'm sorry, I've practiced the name, but I've completely failed right now. Um, he's a Greek guy who does some really interesting graphic scores. Uh, it's almost art to look at. And um, there's also interpretations of how to play this. So um, let's say that every line is one instrument, and it gives you a clue on the left what pitch you should start at, like there's a bottom pitch and a top pitch, and then over the stretch of time, like this is 54 seconds, 53 seconds, 52 seconds, it gives you a clear idea of how to play it. But again, it's very open to interpretation. So it will sound like this. Maybe this is the most honest representation of, of music individually because you, you see what you hear. You see, you get what you hear, you get what you see. So it's uh, from from all these different, and there's so many more. There's a guy who drives in a car, holds a sheet paper covered in uh, a music sheet, uh, covered in glue, holds it out of the window of the car, where the flies hit the paper, that's where you play the notes, for example. This is all different ways of how to write down your music or how to compose. Um, I did a, a project in 2000. 13, 2014, where I, when I was in high school, I was really interested in the, all the combinations of lines in a square, and, and that's straight lines or diagonal lines, and nothing in between. So um, I really wanted to be able to find a way how to calculate this without having to draw them all out. But when I got into art school, I thought, well, I might turn it around, I'll draw them all out, and then I'll try to calculate it. It turns out it was really easy because it's binary, uh, so it's 256 uh, options. Uh, and I have, have this whole stack of papers uh, uh, somewhere left in my home now. Then I figured, well, maybe we'll turn it into some visual art, make it like a visual 3D representation of it. 
that's where it stopped because it got really boring. But then I thought, well, maybe this can be the basis of uh, a notation script, how to write down um, a rhythmic uh, representation of music so that everyone can see it and right away understand, okay, if we take a square, we turn it into eight pieces and we let it run like a clock. So the first square will be first and then the second square will be second. And um, we can have a tempo by, let's say, lighting up each part of the square in sequence. And uh, let's say you project it on a screen in, in a room and people look at it and they have what you have in the bottom left, a, um, a representation of a um, well notation. Every black square is where you play when the clock hits that square. And every white square, you don't do anything. And um, of course, this is a problem when you want to write music because music is more than just rhythm. So you want to have a certain melodic opportunity. And uh, uh, the concept was to have it in a certain U to turn, uh, to, let's say you make it lighter, the tone is higher, you make it darker, the tone is lower. And that way, it's still open to interpretation by how high the pitch is by the player. Uh, yeah, it, I, I abandoned this after designing the first prototype, um, which I will show you in a bit. Um, because at first I wanted to be able to find a way to represent this in an instrument so that people can read it and then play it right away. Um, so the, um, I wanted to stay away from string instruments uh, that you have to pluck and you have to put your finger in a specific location to generate a conventional tone. Um, and there is so many artists that have done very, very interesting stuff with this, but the one that I really, really like personally is Harry Parch. And Harry Parch has a guy whose parents were missionaries. They came from Asia. They brought with them this uh, fascination for Chinese and, and Japanese uh, opera, which I'm not sure if you guys know it, but it's, it's quite difficult to listen to if you're not trained to or you don't really want to put yourself in because it takes hours and hours. And if you don't understand the language, it sounds like it's difficult to, to wrap your hands around. Uh, so as a young boy, he was exposed to these very foreign sounds. He lived in California, but he also went to these presentations of Native Americans playing their native music, which is also non-conventional in our from our Western perspective. Uh, Harry Parch decided that when he went to um, uh, the university to study music, after one or two years, he didn't want to uh, continue because it was too limiting um, being a musician in Western culture because you would have to play classical music. And uh, classical music was, well, it was really structured. It didn't allow him to experiment. Uh, so he dropped out. And through his life, he's been patronized to make instruments like these and compose uh, operas for them. Uh, he adopted a lifestyle of being a hobo, traveling on trains through the USA the same time as Jack Kerouac wrote uh, On the Road. Um, so it's interesting that Jack Kerouac, his book gets a lot of like um, um, beatnik culture appreciation. Um, and in a certain way, you can understand that it's a rite of passage of a young boy. But at the same time, looking at his work and his operas, they are very raw. They really show the pain of this world of men traveling around the U.S., trying to find work, uh, dying in the process of jumping on trains, of tra jumping off trains, um, often being very, very lonely. Um, it's a rough life. And he, this, this formed these scribblings on the wall, scribblings on train tracks, uh, by these hobos form the language and the words for his operas. You can still see live um, presentations of this work in the USA. Uh, they still use the traditional instruments. Um, I'm, it's something that I really desire to do one day. So audio generation. I, I really like what he does here. This is, if, if I had all the time in the world, I would most definitely explore these. But at the same time, to mass produce this into a product, it becomes quite complex. You would need a lot of workshop tools. You would need to understand um, uh, how these, um, how, you, how to create certain tonal differences. And again, in a way, it is quite limiting because you have only the sounds that you have on 
the glass bells or on the, the bamboo blocks. And if you want true atonal or um, microtonal music, you would have to abandon these, um, pri the decision by the music, uh, the instrument designer. So for me, uh, there was a clear decision to go along with uh, electronics, uh, digital or analog. Well, um, when you look at the work by Theodore Adorno, uh, in On Popular Music, he wrote a piece about pseudo individualization, which is um, when you are exposed to pop culture, uh, you will automatically start to divide yourself based upon certain things that align well with you on uh, a certain uh, class, a certain group. This is a very good example. Um, uh, this is a step further from Adorno because he was, he was writing this in 1932 um, and uh, just after he fled um, um, Germany. But uh, he was really disappointed with the way how pop culture, pop music was developing. Um, he said, well, uh, look at Gershwin uh, later on uh, where you have these factories where people sit down, one guy writes the rhythm, one guy writes the melody, one guy writes the lyrics, and together they form a song and it's being put out. Some boy or girl records it who looks nice and they have a nice appearance, they have a good name in the, in the music industry already. And then they, um, they have a hit or they don't. And they get paid a uh, salary and the company will make all the profit when it becomes a hit, but they will take all the damage if it doesn't. It's an industry, really. Um, so you could say that the Beatles have been perfecting this into a, a product for us. Uh, they made stupid mistakes. They sold their T-shirt rights away for a couple of bucks and, and some other guy became a millionaire with it. Um, but at this point with Justin Bieber, for example, we pretty much understand how to market and turn music into a, a whole product. Like you, you don't just buy the records by Justin Bieber. You don't just buy the clothing. You buy the lifestyle that belongs to being a fan of Justin Bieber. You are a believer. And so the same um, with this choice in how to make music, if I choose uh, how to make the sound, if I choose one direction of, and not the band, but one direction in how to approach sound synthesis, um, it might carry a certain cultural weight. It might carry a, a certain interpretation by people. If I choose string instruments and it sounds microtonal, you might right away will have this Eastern element in there. And that will give people the idea that, oh, you're trying to do something with Eastern music. No, no. We're really trying to go to bare bones sonic exploration. Um, and I found that the avant-garde electronic explorers from the previous century really embodied this search because they don't just go into uh, sound exploration. They really go down to the bare bones of what sound is. This is Dick Reimakers. He used to work in the Philips Net Lab in the Netherlands. Um, he, along with a, another colleague, wrote the first electronic pop song uh, that became a, a hit in the Netherlands. Um, but he also made visual art that was that's very enticing. Uh, for example, he filled in, uh, we have these large fortifications in the Netherlands, which is which are open in the middle. And he had this pump pumping up water, thousand gallons uh, up to the top. And then all at once they would open up and all the sound, the water would crash down. And because it's a, a stone building, this would resonate through the buildings. I wasn't there because it was in the 1992 and I was only five years old, but I would have loved to have been there because it, it must have been fantastic. Um, so this guy, along with very, very many other um, uh, explorers, discovered how to work with tape. They discovered how to work with oscillators. Um, all of these are you know, equipment that is not really available to the masses at the time. Philips was developing tape recorders, so I guess he had an unlimited amount of access to these equipment. But um, you will find that they try to make music with equipment not built to make music with. They go to, you know, the, the oscillator, the frequency that you work with, the speed, the, the amplitude, and try to find how does it feel when I do this? What happens when I do that with tape? Play it backwards, speed it up. And these things um, 
I found fascinating enough to think, okay, well, I really want to use this as a basis. And from there on, it's a choice of, okay, if you want to work with these analog history, these analog sounds that are going to fail at times, that are going to, they're going to shift at times, how are you going to steer them? And there's, I, I made this, a list of all the possible sensors, and there's um, 13 pages of different types, the 13 A4 pages of different types of sensors. Um, and some of them are, are really cheap. Like, I think you can get a LDR for like 20 cents. Um, and some of them, uh, they will cost you a couple of million because they are only used in the CERN research facilities to, to look for the little tiny particles. Um, so it, you start to narrow down the more conventional ones. For example, um, uh, you would start to work with uh, potentiometers that you can move with your hand. But after a while, you think, okay, well, maybe we want to remove ourselves from these ideas and find different ways to control the synthesizers. So we came down to the first prototype. I brought it with me, and it still it matches this. I'll turn this up a bit to see if we can show it. So it still matches this 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 grid for the for the the music notation. But at this point, um, I realized that going from music notation to making a product was not a, the best idea because it, it I think. It's more interesting. It gets really quick, boring very quickly, I think, for children. Um, and it, it's more interesting to give them a tactile experience. So buttons that make a click and potentiometers. And these LEDs, they will light up really brightly red when they, they go on. I have, a, I have a short video of this. So right away you hear this like tangerine dream kind of thing going on you know it's, it's a sequence and for me the sequencer was the first like because of the notation but also because i really wanted to have a sequencer um was the first step but as you can see you know it takes a lot of soldering and and really bad soldering because uh, <laughs> it will fall apart um but to to get it working and it, it takes a lot of time to to figure out because you will lose yourself in the wires and the and the the prototyping board but it worked and this was a like a an achievement to to get to because um up to that point i never built an electronic instrument um now the the next step is you want to get away from uh all these mistakes that you've made by building the first prototype you want to make a new instrument that um that leaves behind the bad stuff, but takes along the good stuff. So you're going to look into what kind of, what can we make that if we put it in the hands of a child, it's not going to break down and it's going to work according to the plan that they can make music right away. So the first step is control. How are they going to control it? Well, this is the dream paradise of a child, a nuclear reactor control center. Of course, <laughs> the, all the buttons and all the, the, everything you touch uh, will have a light on it and, and you can move it around and it, the downside is is you don't really get a direct response uh, because uh, well it will take a while for the meltdown to happen but this is fantastic you know you, you push a button it lights up right away and your entire environment starts to move you get this instant almost like physical kick out of it it has intuitive controls even though if you don't understand numbers you don't know which floor you go but you understand that it's a button and you push it um, it has an instant response, so the door starts closing you going up and down, and it requires zero motor skills except doing this. That's a nice start. Um, th the great thing about it is you don't really have to design it uh, in such a complex way because children learn while playing. You know, they start playing with clay, they know that the, they learn this textility, playing with crayons on a 2D uh, platform. We kind of lose this because we start learning in a more structured fashion, but um, hopefully we still have, especially as musicians, this fascination for playing and learning new stuff. Um, kids uh, primarily function this way. Uh, they learn their social skills by interacting with other kids and with their parents um, and not from a book. So it's, 
And the nice thing about this is, is there's a way to, uh, to des describe it. Uh, children are almost continuously in a state of flow. Um, they have specific degree of abilities that are not very high, so it's really easy to, to get a challenge. Um, and uh, their challenges are provided to them continuously by their environment. Okay, well, here, let's try and walk. They, you pick them up. Well, they can't really walk, but they enjoy looking at your face and holding your hands enough that they are training themselves to get to that stage of walking on their own eventually. Um, if you see a, see a kid in a, in a sandbox um, completely enveloped in their own reality, this is um, a child being in flow. Downside with it, and especially in traditional fashions of education, for example, is you have a, a teacher in front of a classroom who is completely in his element and he's talking to you, um, you know, and his mind is running, and the students are just sitting there and they have to absorb it. That's, from my perspective, and then we're in this situation a bit right now, but um, uh, that means that the teacher is in flow and the student isn't, and flow is the stage where you learn the most. So... Maybe this is a way to teach children, you know, by playing some new stuff. But it says 1975. Milahi Milahi is a, a guy who def defined this state. And you can't imagine that people, this is such a fundamental way of how people function that they didn't think of it before. Uh, Schopenhauer, I don't expect you to read the entire thing, but maybe you want, um, uh, defined music as one of the most fundamental ways that a human uh, can experience the universal language, the universe itself. Um, he even refers to it as doing an arithmetic exercise and you don't even remember that you're working math. Um, I know that most, most people will find math problematic and they will sit down and they're crunching their mind. But the moment you understand how the math problem works is a eureka moment. And you feel confident and you feel uh, achievement and you understand a bit more about the universe. So in ancient times, they had someone called, uh, a Greek god called Kairos, uh, who kind of gets close to this flow concept. Um, he has a lock of hair on his forehead, and you grab him by the lock of the hair, and he takes you away with the wings that, maybe you see it's in the left corner, there's a little tiny wing, it's uh, situated on his heels, and uh, he will fly into the sky and take you with him. And this is almost like an inspiring moment, an inspiritus. The, in, the spiritus, the God, enters in you. And um, they believe that if you are in this eureka moment, uh, where you are really, really at the edge of your ability and the challenge, so this flow, this is the moment that Kairos will appear to you, and if you manage to grab him by the lock of the hair, he will take you with you, and he will reward you with the gifts of the gods. Pythagoras... Um, was a big fan of this and um, uh, contrary to what most people will believe he is um, not the logical guy that we thought him to be he's more of a mystical um, cult leader who thought that mathematics were so important they were the language of the gods and Kairos was the rhythm so if you manage to grab him by the lock often enough you will get these rewards of the gods and understand mathematics you understand the gods um, this in relation to music and art, they have this god, um, Memo Sine. I'm sorry about for the pronunciation, but uh, she is the goddess of memory. And she has these nine daughters called the Muses. And they are the Muses of the arts. And up to the 1500s, Kant defined, um, started defining our human behavior in a certain way. And after that, it started to decline. But up to the 1500s, um, being a shoemaker was an art being able to do something so profoundly and proficiently that it becomes, um, you get into this flow, you get into this chirotic moment, and you make an object that is almost defined, then you can be an artist. Um, and maybe that's, you know, it's, it's the point where arts become um, more defined towards sculpture and painting. And a downside to this is that... Uh, um, these pe it, people tend to forget that these are just people working in uh, someone giving them money, make me a painting, paint my you know, cathedral, this kind of stuff. They were just craftsmen, same as a shoemaker. Hi, Ole. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we have to finish at uh, 1 p.m. sharp. Is it okay if we can finish off and maybe have a little time for questions? Yes, let me run through the last bit real quick. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So um, in music, you would say... Um, 
to have this fluent way of talking is like the improvisation in jazz. You don't have to think about it, you just play it. Um, so the feel of the instrument. There's no menu diving. No menu diving. I think all the synthesizer people would agree that this is tedious as hell and you need no hidden features. It should be chunky and you should be able to let it uh, live a long life. And the way it should look, well, I wish it could look like this, but that was too many wires. Frank Lloyd Wright did it right. This is a Usonian house. It cost you 7,000 US dollars in the 1950s, which was equivalent to a really modest living, uh, modest living space from which most people with a, a postal office job could get. And he built a house that now costs you a million uh, for that price. Um, thinking everyone should be living in an environment that should enhance the experience of living. So the same way, the instruments should give you an experience of playing. And it should be compatible. Not really MIDI, because MIDI requires me too much digital and, and, and too much wires. But your rack is very possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, so now we get to the current versions. We did some field tests. This is an example where we just put it in an exhibition space, open it up for, up for a few days, and children can play around with it all they want. I've been going past other uh, instrument builders, mostly uh, electronic uh, developments, and asked them how they work with it. This is an instrument designed specifically for people with Alzheimer's and disabilities. Um, but it, it, it's a different approach. They play samples rather than uh, let them really create. Um, of course, there's new for future editions upcoming, if, including an instrument that requires fidget spinners. Um, and if you want to come and play on them uh, and check out the other projects, there's, there's more that we're working on. Um, there's an exhibition with Olme also um, in Heimland Kunstverening, uh, and it will open on the 27th this month. If there are any questions, then this is the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah? Yeah? Hi, yeah. I, actually, I, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, at, at the start of your uh, talk, you talked about extra disciplinary. And yeah. Interdisciplinary. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in your opinion, how important is it to be interdisciplinary or extradisciplinary to be successful in the field of sonification or, or art in general? Well, I think in, in, in music, for example, you already have the benefit that you very often play together with other people. Um, so uh, in music, there's already this tendency to work together with others. Um, you can work all on your own, of course, but you find that talking with others about your work and having a, a field to reflect upon someone else to reflect upon your work and vice versa, that it will help you develop perspective. Um, uh, I think that this is not just limited to sonic or to visual art, but you can find it in any field that you can specialize in. Is it bricklaying or uh, being a farmer? By talking to other people that are specialized in other fields, you get different perspectives. And by finding ways to integrate these perspectives in your workflow or in you know, the results that you're trying to achieve with, by working, um, well, let's say in sonification. Um, uh, I know that there is a project that was done here in Trondheim by turning the bridge into uh, an instrument. And you can't do this without you know, considering how bridges work. So you have no experience in bridge building, but you research the subject of bridge building, not to become an expert in bridge building, but you try to find enough information to find stuff that you can use for your project, and then you can make relationships with people that you otherwise would not have relationships with. For example, the people that use the bridge on a daily basis, or even the people who build bridges, who might say, well, this is something that we never thought about, or you, know, you have a different angle in looking at the world. So I think there is, and you can absolutely survive the world by locking yourself up in, a, in, a, in, in your uh, attic, and become a really good producer and have the entire world listen to your track on the internet. But personally, I wouldn't find it very satisfactory, but it's my personal experience. So I think that that is, I don't think it's a necessity, but I think it's interesting enough to go out in the world and experience life 
in relation to other perspectives. Yeah. Thank you. I can't believe I was this clear. <laughs> Uh, question. Uh, yeah. Uh, could you please uh, tell something about your prototypes? You said that they, they were designed especially for kids, or like are they also uh, helpful in kind of ensembles or concerts or anything? Like Sorry. The, oh no, the yeah. yeah. So um, uh, the idea is that it's a standalone system. So you have a speaker, which you can you can use. Um, uh, I don't know. There's no no camera here, but you have a speaker which has a volume control knob on the side. You don't have to turn it with your hand, which requires motor skill. You can just slide it. It's very easy. Um, of course, it has large jacks, so you can just plug in the, the, the thick stuff. But it requires power, which is a bit of a problem because you have to understand you know, polarity and this kind of stuff uh, to, to put it in. Um, hopefully, in the future, I'll just have a wire running out. But all the other stuff, like this, for example, um, if, you understand, if you know the Bukla Music ISO has a touchpad, but um, many others like the Wasp synthesizer also, um, here you are the resistor. So by touching one and two of these plates, you are becoming the resistance in between a capacitor. And by giving more skin, the electricity can run through your body faster and the capacitor will unload quicker, so the tone will go up and vice versa. So um, it doesn't require any explanation because you will just put your hands in it and because for some reason people feel that this is a good place to put your hands in and you will get a response right away. Same with the sequencer. What is better than to give kids a ton of knobs to play with? By pushing on a button, the light in the button lights up so you know light is on and no light is off. This is like a very simple notion that most people understand and most kids understand as well. Um, because they get taught this by putting the lights in the room on and off. Um, and low and high pitch. So it's, it's really, diff really easy. Um, you have one knob for, this, for the, the amplitude. Um, sorry, this one broke off, but I can repair it. One for the speed. Same principle. You just run your hand on top of it, change the pitch. And the moment that a step is running, the light corresponding to the step lights up. This maybe is a bit more difficult because it requires an external input. But this is a reverb tank with, I don't know if you can hear it, uh, springs. And um, you can put an instrument in, turn the volume up or down. And this, the middle one is a mixer. And the left one is the amount of reverb that you can put in. And so um, this one is compatible with your rack, for example. You can control each parameter with it. This is a clock in and out. Um, this one is a bit more bare bones because it allows you only to to make a sound, but you can use this to have your Eurorack sounding as well. So everything is you know, we try to make it in such a way that when you buy it, your you can have it until you have a professional studio and then use it in live performances or use it in your studio as well. So that's how we try to make it for work for kids. Yeah. you had a question as well. Yeah, it was the same if you had. Yeah, yeah. So we're coming with new uh, prototypes as well. The future to get to the next step is to make the housing out of aluminum and mill the slides and the, the holes in and then bend it into a shape and have wooden sides, very 70s style. Um, but because it, it's very expensive to have these machines, I'm looking into where can I get an, a, a nice space to experiment with this more freely. Um, but up till that point, we we're just working on new prototypes, like for example, the fidget spinner low frequency oscillator, where we use a uh, um, guitar element, and the fidget spinner has these nice metal um, weights in it. By spinning it around, it goes past the guitar element, and you generate this LFO. Um, it will have a, a, a square wave generator inside to generate sound, but hopefully we can find a way to patch it out so you can use it in any you know, Eurorack setting as well. Um, there will be a sampler, very crude, but you know, a uh, bare bones sampler where you can have a microphone instrument that you can plug into the uh, reverb uh, box as well. Uh, plug it into the, to the sampler, hit a button on the microphone that lights up, you talk in it, you record your voice, you play it back, and 
maybe in the future we'll add a little keyboard module where you can you know, play back your voices if it's a keyboard. Although I don't like the concept of a keyboard so much, and maybe we'll make it look a bit different. So it's, it has more of a natural approach to give you the idea of low and high, maybe some, some tactile um, uh, resistor or something like this. Yeah. So that's what we're working with right now. Hopefully in the future we'll have it to a degree that it might actually be at a stage because now as you might see, this is not really market ready <laughs> to a point where we can actually put it out and have people work with it in a professional level as well. But I do perform with it sometimes. So I do performances on stage and yeah. Go. Any more questions or we? Okay, well I'd like to just say thank you to- There's one last one, but- One last one? I can't uh, see from here. Is it, is it uh, like, because uh, uh, there's uh, different boxes, is it one instrument that they all, you have to have all three to like make it work or oh. are they individual instruments? That you no, can it's, 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 everything is loose. So um, you can only have the speaker and put yeah. your MP3 player in it, it works. You can only have the sequencer, although you need an amplifier to hear it, but you can put headphones in it and it yeah. works. It works very well with headphones, yeah. Only on one side. <laughs> would, would it be possible to actually show Oslo the equipment? Because we yeah. have not oh. seen it until now. Let me, can I, if I turn it like this, because I, I don't see the, oh, there we are, yeah. This is the, the speaker module, but it's upside down, no? Huh? Or do you see it the right way? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, it's upside down. Okay. <laughs> there. So this is the speaker module with the control knob on the side. Mm -hmm. I thought you had a visual on the other camera as well. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, no, that's okay. And then there's this, uh, I, I call it a kist, a box, where you have all these metal plates and you can yeah. control it. This originated as an idea that I wanted to have a literal sandbox and the sand in between two plates like two large plates would um, uh, function as a resistance in a capacitor, but it's uh, too large to work as a capacitor, sadly. Um, maybe with water it might to a certain degree, but it, 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 yeah, I'm, I haven't figured it out. And here is the, uh, it's too large maybe to, there. But they should see it there at the bottom. Yeah, okay, but I thought that I should, it showed it. Here is the, uh, the sequencer uh, module. So it's, uh, it's really big for what, what's inside. Like, I glued it up so I can't show you the inside, but, but from what's inside, there's only like this much of, of electronics, but there's, you need the space to give someone the ability to move the slides around without re hitting other slides and the buttons. Besides that, I really like the really big instruments from the past that you have an entire wall just to make one sound, but that's too much, I guess. And then there's the, it has a wire on the back, so I try to pick it up. <coughs> nah. Here is the uh, the uh, reverb box. It has a, a LED that fell out, which signals when you get an input, and on the other side you have the output. And there's some you have some electronics that you can look at, but and uh, and, and the downside here is. This one takes 12 volt AC, which means that I have to put a really expensive uh, power supply in, which I have to figure out how to work around because it, 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 take, it, only, it takes 30 euros just to get power in and then another, another 30 for the reefer module. But there should be a way to around this, but I haven't got the time yet to do that. So hopefully that, that gave you a better picture of the, of the instruments. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for coming. And of course, special thank you to Ola for coming down. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much.